Good evening, everyone. Thank you all, you aldermen and our guests for showing up tonight. I'm glad you're here. I know it's summer and there's a lot of things going on and thank you for being here tonight. President Hanna, will you please call the roll? Yes, I will. Boren. Here. Bow. Excused. Serta. Excused. Gesha. Excused. Hanna. Here. Heideman. Here. Kittleson. Here. Clyunas. Here. Manny. Here. Meyer. Here. Montemore. Here. Rinfleisch. Here. Ryan. Here. Vanderweil. Excused. Verhasset. Excused. Wangerman. Here. Eleven present, we have a quorum. Thank you. Moving on to our next item on the agenda, it's our RC number 800708 by City County Shared Services from June 18th, 2007. Council agenda number 661. Your committee to whom was referred the task of studying possible shared services with the county submits the findings of a study of combined joint dispatch. The City County Shared Services Committee unanimously supports combined dispatch and requests consideration from the Council. Mr. Maples, would you please come up and give your presentation? Um, do we need to dim the lights? Okay. And what mic will you be using? I'd like to uh, thank you all for uh, partaking in the presentation this evening. My name is Gary Maples. I'm a uh, participant in the Shared County City County Shared Services Committee. And uh, as part of the City County Shared Services Committee, uh, I became uh, chairperson of a subcommittee to look at the implementation of combined dispatch. Uh, so with that, let's continue with the first uh, slide. This will take approximately 30 to 35 minutes. Um, first of all, I need to explain what the subcommittee did, which is what I'm going to report on this evening. The subcommittee did not review whether this was a good idea or not, being combined dispatch, whether it was a good idea or not, or reasons why or why not. That issue was already dealt with by the Shared Services Committee itself, and you can see on November 9th, 2006, the Shared Services Committee as a whole, uh, approved the concept of looking into combined dispatch. So the uh, subcommittee was really appointed for the purposes of reviewing how could combined dispatch be put into effect. So just so you understand what the purpose of the committee was. One of the things that shared services saw, if you look at the third bullet point here, is that uh, it came to the realization that perhaps uh, there wasn't a tremendous amount of cost savings uh, nevertheless, there were good reasons for going forward to look at combined dispatch. Uh, so this is just a continuation of the resolution that was passed by the City County Shared Services Committee and uh, appointment of the subcommittee, as I mentioned. Oops. Got ahead of myself here. Uh, here's a list of the members who participated in the subcommittee. There were three citizen members as listed on the top. Ken Conger, a supervisor. Uh, Renee Susha at the beginning of the committee and then Dan Verhasselt at the end of the committee representing the city council. And then you'll see as you go down the list uh, pretty much a representative from every emergency service area within the county. Uh, and so we had a lot of good input. It was uh, process started in December of 2006 and wound up in early May of 2007. This is a very open process. Uh, these were all uh, open committee meetings. And uh, for the most part, these people attended on a very consistent basis. Towards the end, we were meeting on uh, about an every other week basis. We also had some additional support, particularly from uh, Russ Schreiner, who was a city communications technician, uh, answered a lot of our technical issues for us. I do want to go back for one second. I need to point out uh, two individuals in particular, uh, Jan, uh, Lieutenant Jan Reinfeldt, who's here this evening, and uh, 
Director of Operations in the Sheriff's Department, Bill Bruckbauer. Uh, they wound up doing most of the, uh, the legwork for the committee because many questions were asked of them and it was, get us an answer for this, get us information on that. So those two people, and I wanted to particularly single them out, were particularly important uh, to the committee's work. And I, I thank both of them for their efforts. All right, while the uh, subcommittee really did not have as a purpose uh, the reasons to look at combined dispatch, I did want to spend a minute or two talking about what were some of the reasons behind the idea of looking at combined dispatch and why it might be a good idea even though there might not be tremendous cost savings. Well, I've got a list on this slide and the next slide of reasons to look at combined dispatches, though, as I, again, as I said, uh, the purpose of the subcommittee was not really to review these. These had already been accepted by Shared Services Committee. The first is a uh, cellular answering point is centralized. Uh, you may or may not know that if you call 911 on a cell phone, any place in the county, that call is going to be answered by a county dispatcher at the law enforcement center. You could be standing in this room right here, and if you dial 911 on your cell phone, it will not be answered on the first floor in the police department dispatch. It will be answered by a county dispatcher. If it is determined that the call is coming from a city of Sheboygan location, that call is then transferred to city dispatch. So there's always a transfer if you're talking about a 911 call, uh, if it is in fact coming from within the city boundaries. Uh, obviously there's some issues anytime you transfer something there's a potential for a problem. So that is, uh, that is one existing issue is the transfer of 911 calls. The other thing uh, the committee uh, learned as the, the Shared Services Committee learned is that the, the level, the, the percentage of 911 cellular calls is, has gone in most counties from 40 to 50 or more percent. So more and more calls are coming in to 911 from cell phones, not on landlines. The second thing is a common dispatch point from, uh, we looked at, uh, Shared Services Committee looked at about six different counties that had combined dispatch. And one of the reasons they had combined dispatch for the entire county is so that you, you have interoperability and you don't have split uh, authorities and split communications uh, to some degree. Uh, natural disasters like uh, tornadoes or something like a chemical spill out on I-43 does not necessarily represent boundary lines like city county boundary lines. They can be going across boundary lines. So it makes a certain amount of sense to have dispatch, one common dispatch for all emergency operations within the county rather than to have it split. In the long run, there are some operational efficiencies and to improve services to the public. I won't get into a long list, but things like training, uh, things like planning, things like having depth of, uh, of uh, personnel. Long-term cost containment and efficiency, the idea being that you're planning for one oper emergency operation center, or I shouldn't say, uh, one combined dispatch center and not two or more. So standardized training, I already mentioned that. And then there's the potential for something called emergency medical dispatch. And let me take a minute just to explain what that is. Emergency medical dispatch has to do with the training that dispatchers have in an emergency situation. City dispatchers are trained, city Sheboygan dispatchers are trained to give over the telephone emergency direction and assistance. They will try to walk you through what the emergency is and try to give you some assistance over the phone until the emergency responders arrive at your location. County dispatchers are not trained. County dispatchers can give you some, some elemental medical assistance, but they are not trained in emergency medical dispatch. So again, you have some disparity between what county dispatchers can do and what, what uh, city dispatchers can do, and it would be nice to uh, take care of that difference. We uh, have the advantage in Sheboygan County where really we only have two dispatch centers. Some of the counties we looked at combined, eventually combined, 5, 10, 15, or 20 or more different dispatch centers into one. Well, we're kind of uh, ahead on the curve already because we only have two to talk about. All right, another thing that uh, we have going for us in Sheboygan County is the city and the county, thanks to some wisdom a number of years ago, have a common radio system. They also have common dispatch councils, and we'll talk about dispatch councils a little bit later, and dispatch software. 
And we saw the review of the other six other counties that we looked at. They indicated they had very satisfactory conversion to combined dispatch. They were pleased with it, and they were glad they made the decision. Through combined dispatch, uh, it was determined that everybody gets the same level of service, and the idea is to spread the cost over as broad a base as possible. So again, while the subcommittee was not charged to look at these reasons, I thought it might be helpful to share the reasons for with you that shared services came up with. Again, it doesn't necessarily save in any money. And the six counties we talked to said that. They said don't expect a lot of operational savings because you probably won't get it. However, there are very, other, there are very good other reasons to do so. All right, what did the subcommittee do? Well, there were three things, the sub, uh, three issues that needed to be addressed. First of all, was the decision to consider combined dispatch. That decision was already made by the, the uh, Shared Services Committee. The next point was creation of a general work plan, which is what we're going to look at this evening. And that was the purpose of the subcommittee. The subcommittee was to put together a framework for how could this be done. And then the last was, if everybody is in agreement and it moves forward, the last step was implementation. And uh, our estimate is a 12 to 18 month implementation time period. All right, what did the subcommittee do? Well, we started out by gathering pertinent information. As I indicated, uh, this was done over approximately a four month period uh, under an open meeting basis where all information was shared. Uh, we formulated a potential plan, including some options. And then in the end, we reviewed the plan for some possible emissions and also for comparisons to other counties. What did we look at? What was in our work plan? Well, what we had to address as far as this work plan for putting together combined dispatch was facilities, equipment, backup, workforce, emergency medical dispatch, governments, and funding. And I will address all of those individually. All right. Well, what we soon discovered was that there was no simple solution. We thought at the beginning that perhaps we would be able to focus on and come up with one single set of parameters or criteria for combined dispatch. We found it wasn't quite that easy. We did notice that there are different options, and these different options have different strengths and weaknesses, and the different options also have different costs. All of the options have trade-offs. If you choose one, you give up something over, some, of, over another option. We attempted to recognize all reasonable options. We came down to about five. All right, the first thing you had to decide on was what, what would be the location? If you had combined dispatch, where would you put it? Well, the county law enforcement center next to the courthouse on 6th Street uh, does not have sufficient space inside. Uh, it has a dispatch operation for the county now within the law enforcement center. But there's not a lot of additional space available inside. The city hall on the first floor here in this building is uh, extremely tight for space. So that presented some problems if you tried to combine dispatch in either of the existing locations. And we'll talk about in a minute how that was addressed. So we reviewed some options for location. Well, once you decide the location, you start driving the equipment needs. Once you decide where combined dispatch could be, you start focusing on what kind of equipment do we need. And once, you'd, uh, once you have arrived at the location equipment, then you can also deal with the backup dispatch, and we'll talk about that in a second. All right, equipment requirements. Once we've dealt with location, then the next thing we had to look at was re equipment requirements. Dispatch operations require dispatch councils, and there really are a, it's a collection of electronic equipment, computers, printers, electronic support packages, and furniture that uh, the dispatchers use. And as I said, fortunately, through some foresight, both the city and the county use exactly the same dispatch councils and exactly the same software. So there are some benefits on combined dispatch of you don't have to abandon some equipment. Uh, currently, the uh, County Law Enforcement Center has about three and a half dispatch councils, and the uh, city has about two and a half dispatch councils. The ideal number for combined dispatch would be five to six. So you'd need five to six councils and obviously the equipment, support equipment that goes with it to create a combined dispatch. So in either case, some additional dispatch councils and, and support equipment would have to be required. Uh, have to be added. Also on the bottom, additional councils required for backup. 
Well, let's talk about this backup issue, and it's probably something that we hadn't really thought about a lot when we entered in the process of looking at how could we put together a framework for combined dispatch. But right now, the city and the county act as, ba as backup for each other. If something would happen to the law enforcement center on North 6th Street, the county could shift dispatch operations to the dispatch, the city dispatch in this building. And on the other hand, if something happened to this building, the city could shift dispatch to the county law enforcement center on North 6th Street. The problem is there's not really enough physical room and there's not a full set of councils. Again, remember this, the county's operating with about three councils and the city's operating with about slightly more than two, about two and a half councils. So the problem is if you move to the all operations to the law enforcement center or you move all operations to city hall, you don't have enough councils. The backup as it exists now is really temporary in nature. It's something that, that you could operate for several hours. For example, if all power were lost in the law enforcement center for four, five, six, seven, eight hours, maybe even a day, you could squeeze everybody in the dispatch here at City Hall and it would work. However, neither one of the sites really provide any long-term backup uh, simply because they're not physically big enough and neither one of them has enough councils to support the city and the county at the same time. Now, creating a combined, the other issue is that they are relatively close to each other. The law enforcement center and city hall are not physically very far apart. A tornado or some other sort of a, a chemical or spill or something could easily take out both of them. So that's an issue that, has, that uh, is also there as far as backup. Creating a combined dispatch center eliminates any backup backup as we know it now. Even though present backup is not adequate, at least there is some form of backup. Uh, after looking at the backup situation, the subcommittee uh, did reach the conclusion that backup is critical and uh, it simply cannot be ignored. All right, so that's what some of the things we need to look at. Now let's get a little bit more specific. We looked at five physical locations. Uh, physical location facility option A was to remodel and expand the existing law enforcement center dispatch uh, dispatch operation on North 6th Street in the county law enforcement center. There's a room to there's room to do a slight amount of expansion. However, you would never get more than four councils in at by expanding the existing county law enforcement center dispatch. There simply would not be much room for more than four councils, and ideally, there should be five or six. Facility option B would be to add an extension to the law enforcement center, 1,600 square feet on the north side of the law enforcement center. Option C would be to add 1,800 square feet, and you'll see when we look at the numbers, going from 1,660 to 1,860 feet is not a significant cost increase and 1,800 square feet added to the north side of the law enforcement center would in fact provide some re re room for expansion in the future. A fourth option, which we had not really thought of when we started out, but we came to a realization that uh, there could be facility option D could be location of combined dispatch at the new city police department. The new city police department is planned to have approximately 700 square feet for dispatch. So if you expanded the new police department by an additional 1,000 square feet, you would have 1,750 square feet or so for combined dispatch in the new police department. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The last option, which is probably not too attractive, but we needed to put it in uh, to show what the potential cost is at least, would be to build a brand new, in which some of these counties that we talked to, they created a brand new this combined dispatch building, completely separate facility. All right, plan one. Plan one consists of locating combined dispatch at the county law enforcement center on North 6th Street, and that would be facility option A, B, or C. Expand the existing facility, internal facility slightly, or add expansion B or C. You'd have to add two, two to three additional councils and support equipment. And the backup location then could be at City Hall here, four councils at City Hall here, four councils at the new City Police Department, 
or we even looked into would it be possible to locate four councils out at uh, Lakeshore Technical College uh, because they have a emergency operations center out there, which is not the same as combined dispatch, but we wanted to take a look at that facility as a possibility. So there's sort of three choices if you go to uh, the law enforcement center. All right, plan two was, as indicated, add additional space in the new Sheboygan Police Department. That would require adding six new councils and a support equipment at the Sheboygan PD, the new PD. And again, backup operations would be at City Hall, LTC, or the backup could be at the existing law enforcement center. Plan three. Uh, this was a construction of a brand new 8,000 square foot building, new councils and support equipment, and now we would have four potential backup sites for, uh, for backup operations. City Hall, Law Enforcement Center, Sheboygan, New Sheboygan PD, or the LTC. All right, then we looked at, so those are the locations, and we'll, we'll further elaborate as far as costs in a few minutes. Dispatcher staffing. The county currently has 12 full-time dispatchers. The city has six full-time and six part-time dispatchers. Staffing was determined to be 24 full-time dispatchers. So if you had combined dispatch to cover 24-7, plus vacations, plus training, plus other, other time necessary to cover, you would need 24 full dispatchers. It doesn't quite seem to work out, but looking at the hours and overtime, et cetera, et cetera, and not paying overtime and, and covering the scheduling right, it comes out to 24 full-time dispatchers. All right. This is the new addition that it does not exist. Currently, neither the city or the county dispatch centers have dedicated supervision. The city dispatchers and the county dispatchers report to whoever the watch supervisor, or watch commander, whoever is in charge of the city and uh, or county op uh, emergency operations, police operations at that time. So neither the city or the county currently have dedicated supervisors. When we looked at the other counties who went into combined dispatch, we discovered that they had anywhere besides a full-time communications manager, they had anywhere from three to nine full-time shift supervisors. It takes nine shift supervisors to provide 24-hour, seven-day-a-week uh, supervision. Um, after much discussion on this topic, because you're sort of going from no supervisors to as many as nine supervisors, there was a, I can assure you there was a lot of discussion about the whys and wherefores. In the end, the, uh, the uh, subcommittee was convinced, in fact, that there should be some level of dedicated supervision. This is the only area that would inquire increased costs. And we'll talk about the costs in a minute. But since you're going from no supervisors to some level of supervisors, this is the area that would inquire some increased costs. Now, why do you need to go from, you know, zero, one might argue, why do you need to go from zero supervisors to three or six or nine or whatever the magic number is? Well, one thing you need to recognize is that dispatch has changed a lot in the last 25 or 30 years. I think some people still, still think of, well, dispatch, you've got somebody sitting with a telephone, a piece of paper, and a, and a microphone for the radio. And that when they get a call, they write it down on a piece of paper, and somebody figures out where the nearest unit is, and then they dispatch it. Well, it's far more sophisticated than that. There's a lot of software. There's a lot of technical stuff. The, uh, the dispatchers really need to be highly trained. Uh, it's not like it used to be many years ago. It is a sophisticated operation. And really, even though there are shift commanders or watch commanders, those people simply no longer have the training or the skills to step in and help. So there are some good reasons and the counties that they said that we looked at that went to combine dispatch did, in fact, add some level of supervision. All right. Supervision and operations. Uh, we saw one county had as, three, as few as three ship supervisors. Um, a lot of them had something in the middle, and a couple of them had uh, nine ship supervisors. Nine ship supervisors that I indicated would, uh, would cover things 24 hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The other thing we looked at, emergency medical mist, uh, dispatch, I already mentioned this. This was another issue that came up. And, uh, well, we looked at uh, 
City does have emergency medical dispatch to assist you if you have a medical problem when you call in. County does not have a formal training program. They can give you limited assistance, but not a formal extended uh, protocol. Uh, and the question was, if there would be combined dispatch, should it or should it not have emergency dispatch? Uh, there is some cost to train and certify everybody in emergency dispatch. And there was also a question, do you want to go through the combined dispatch process and emergency medical dispatch training at the same time? It might be a little bit too much. All right, one of the last things we looked at is governance. Combined dispatch operations require a de decision regarding who's going to be in charge. Some of the counties we looked at, as I indicated, created a, an entirely new department. So it was a county department, as an example, but it was not under the sheriff's department, nor was it under the police department, but it was a separate, brand new county dis department to handle combined dispatch. Uh, Looking at some of these counties, as I indicated, combined 5, 10, 15, 20 or more different dispatch centers. And I think for various political reasons and operational reasons, they thought it would be best to, to start with a clean slate and a new department and, and not try to meld it into something existing. Uh, the committee's, uh, I think, the committee's consensus was we really don't have that issue here. We're not trying to combine 20 existing dispatch centers, only two. So perhaps the necessity to create a new dispatch center, a uh, totally separate uh, department of something is not necessary. Uh, now, option B is it could report to the sheriff's department or it could be report to the, the police department. We didn't feel that combined dispatch had necessarily to be under the county supervision as part of the sheriff's department. Uh, as an example, the city of Eau Claire uh, police department provides dispatch for the entire county. So there's no reason it can't be part of city operations. Uh, either option, uh, the last thing we looked at, however, is that either option should sort of had some sort of user input. Uh, right now, the outlying areas, the outlying areas in the county, uh, Plymouth, Elkhart Lake, et cetera, et cetera, Sheboygan Falls, all the volunteer fire departments are users of dispatch, particularly county dispatch, uh, but there's not a formal committee to provide user input. And uh, we thought that there should, as, a combined, as, the, as our uh, subcommittee, there should be some form of advisory committee of the users, uh, regardless of how this, where, where combined dispatch might wind up. All right, let's get down to the hard numbers now, with sort of the background on an explanation of the overview. There's two sets of costs. The hard cost, what would it do to add a new, you know, an expanded facility to acquire the additional equipment? Those are the hard, hard one-time costs. And then the operational costs, the ongoing day-to-day, year-to-year costs. So let's start taking a look at those. Uh, we did look at, uh, before I look at that, we, wanted, we did take a look at funding sources. We didn't get too far into that because the subcommittee kind of came to a rapid conclusion that uh, this was not really our area of, uh, of responsibility. We could make some very, very general suggestions, but we really, it, it was really up to the two legislative bodies, the county board and the city council to decide. But we gave some general recommendations, and they are one is that the hard cost of adding equipment and adding facilities, regardless of where the facility might be, should be shared on some proportional basis between the city and the county. And we didn't, we didn't give any indication what that proportionality should be. Secondly is the operational costs. Uh, we recommend that the uh, operational costs be spread over as broad a tax base as possible. So if there's a combined dispatch operation, it should be uh, spread over the entire tax base in the county. So those were our two recommendations and we stopped at that point. All right, before we talk about the costs, I want to give you a brief background. All costs are based on estimates. We, uh, we have researched these estimates, and they were, as I said, they were all discussed in open meeting. Uh, but we did not go out and bid anything, because obviously we didn't have the authority to go out and bid any projects. Uh, the subcommittee, and I, as the chair of the subcommittee, I have all the detailed information to support the numbers that you're going to see. If anybody wants to see them, I will certainly be happy to provide them to you. In providing cost estimates, wherever possible, we reused existing equipment. 
So we didn't have just abandon because the currently the city and county equipment are relatively new. Uh, there's no urgency to replace either of them in the near future, and they can be adapted. So like the console software, et cetera, et cetera. Costs are driven first by location, then by equipment, and then finally by backup. Not all possible combinations are shown because some of them simply didn't make sense. So let's get down to the uh, four or so uh, alternatives. Here they are. Again, uh, option one is a county law enforcement center, and that is to remodeling the existing dispatch room inside the law enforcement center, expand it slightly, and add two consoles. Uh, but that you'll notice there are some notes on the bottom of each one of these that are germane. I'm not going to go through the notes. Backup choices. Uh, this would be the cost to create the backup. Uh, what you're going to see in all of these is we found that LTC as a potential backup site was going to be very, very expensive. So we put it in here because we wanted you to be aware that we looked at it as an option, but without getting into the details, we found out it was going to be quite an expensive endeavor. All right, location two. Uh, County Law Enforcement Center on North 6th Street expand north 1,660 square feet on the existing building. Uh, you will see the, a fairly uh, hefty cost. One of the reasons being that regardless of where you create a, a new facility or an expanded facility, this is what's called hardened construction. Uh, typically, our cost that we saw for average construction of a municipal facility is about $180 a square foot. But when you get into hardened construction, ceilings, excuse me, ceilings, roofs, walls, subfloors, et cetera, et cetera, you're talking about $270 a square foot because the last thing you don't want is a tornado peeling the roof off. We also discovered that the present emergency power system at the law enforcement center is just about at capacity. And it would have to be increased significantly in order to handle a new dispatch operation. So the, uh, the costs are fairly high. And not just they're fairly high, but there's a reason. There's two reasons why they're fairly high. Uh, backup choices, City Hall, New PD, and LTC. All right, third choice. Add 1,800 square feet to the law enforcement center on the north side. And you will see that, uh, again, the cost isn't a lot more than adding 1,660 square feet, uh, plus two additional councils and a third council. And then backup choices, again, are City Hall, New PD, or uh, Lakeshore Technical College. All right, here's the Sheboygan PD location. As I indicated, there's all, there, right now there's planned into the new city police department 700 to 750 square feet for dispatch. Adding 1,000 square feet, and there's 1,000 square feet, $270 a square foot, $270,000, plus some other things that you would have to add, uh, additional facility costs, minor costs, 60000 total 330 uh, five consoles, $919,000. The backup site, if you use the present county law enforcement center as a backup site, the cost is relatively low because it's there, it has emergency power, and it already has more than four consoles, so, or close to four consoles. So the county... Uh, uh, law enforcement center would be an ideal backup site. Uh, this, if you look at pure cost, this option is the cheapest. Now, we thought it would only be fair to compare if you or another did what some of the other counties, and some of the other counties, because they did some other things, they spent up to $8 million for an entirely separate, brand new, combined dispatch, standalone facility and grounds, et cetera. Uh, we didn't go quite that far, but we looked at construction costs of $4,161,000 construction plus equipment. That's if you were to create a brand new separate facility. So you can see the cost of this is quite uh, extensive. Uh, we are actually, in, uh, as a county and a city, are in a pretty good, uh, pretty good position to add combined dispatch without anywhere near as much to the cost of the other counties. All right, now let's take a, so that's the hard cost. And again, there was a four choices or so, the uh, going into the city PD would be the cheapest. We determined that if you took the existing dispatchers from the city, 
plus the dis existing dispatchers from the county, put them together, they total approximately $1,328,000 a year. That's salaries and benefits, uh, wages and benefits. That's approximately the same cost as being, as being paid now. So by combining dispatch operations, you would not increase the cost for dispatchers. Uh, pretty much a wash. Now, here's the supervisory cost option. This is the one operational cost that goes up. As I indicated to you before, uh, there are no dedicated supervisors for either the city dispatch or the county dispatch. The cost of adding, uh, uh, adding one comm center manager in any case, and then shift supervisors, you can see three, six, or nine. And uh, this would be the one difference in operational costs. Well, I knew it was going to do that. It always freezes up right around here. We'll take care of that. Okay, here's where we left off. Supervisor operation costs, depending upon whether you add three, six, or nine supervisors. Reoccurring operational costs. We looked at things like, you see the note on the bottom, repairs, phone lines, fees, contract supplies, overtime, electricity, et cetera, et cetera. Current city dispatch is about 73,000 a year. Current county dispatch is about 181. We estimated that combined, it would be about 196 or $15,000 more for day-to-day op -day operational costs. However, we took a very conservative position. We, we erred on the side of the most, the, what we thought would be the high side of costs. So in fact, it might be, it might be break even, but it, it certainly wouldn't be more than $15,000 more. All right, emergency medical dispatch, as I mentioned, when we looked at the cost, the cost to create emergency medical dispatch for all the dispatchers, was not exorbitant. It was more of an issue of trying to get combined dispatch and emergency medical dispatch training done at the same time, and that may be a little bit too much at one time. All right, here's a summary. Combined dispatch works and has been accomplished successfully in similar size counties. One-time hard costs are moderate given existing common components. When I say moderate, yes, we're talking about a million dollars in hard costs, but when we compare it to some of the other counties where they combine 5, 10, 15, or 20 or more dispatch operations, the cost is moderate. Dispatcher wages cost and operational cost would increase modestly, if at all, and the largest cost, ongoing cost increase <coughs> would be for supervision component of combined dispatch. Uh, that is the uh, end of the presentation. I, uh, uh, when they're here, I always give them a chance, Jan or Bill. Uh, again, they were instrumental in providing us with the information and assistance. And either one of you have anything you'd like to add or? Okay. So that completes the uh, presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Maples. Yes. Um, Let me I'm gonna step aside here. President Hanna. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to publicly thank Gary Maples for doing such a thorough and complete job. I've had the privilege of seeing this presentation twice, uh, and I'm impressed with the, the amount of work and the man hours that they put into it. Um, I think they gave us, they gave us some good choices to, to look at tonight, uh, and I appreciate all the personal time that Gary's put into this. Well, I, I thank you, but I particularly thank the committee because I was at every committee but meeting, but all the rest of them were there too. So I couldn't have done it without the uh, input of everybody. President Hanna. That being said, I thought I would start the discussion by making a motion this evening. I would move to, to file the document with a recommendation to Mayor Perez to prepare a resolution for passage during the next Common Council meeting requesting the county combine its dispatch facility with the city of Sheboygan's and that the new police station be the location for the combined dispatch uh, with the existing facility of the sheriff being the backup, uh, which I think was your, was that option four or five? I remember the number, but yeah. 
That would be that would be my motion. There's a second. We have a motion and a second on the floor under discussion. Alderman Brainflesh. Uh, thank you, Mrs. President. <laughs> Not sure. Um, no, Chair, Chairwoman, thank you. Um, I've been a fan of, 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 of joint dispatch for some time now without having seen any numbers. Uh, in theory, I mean, it seems to have made some sense to me. I do have some concerns looking at the information that, that has been given to us, uh, first and foremost. Uh, the summary it says it, it does work in, in, in com communities, counties very similar to Sheboygan. Um, but I guess I'm looking for the city taxpayer, where is, is the hard line benefit of that right now? Um, it, we go from s the city paying for six part-time and six full-time to paying for 24 in total. Now, the theory, of course, is that we're spreading that across the operational cost amongst the entire county population versus just the, the city population. Uh, that, to me, is a bonus, um, and I would be very supportive of that. The thing I'm concerned about is that we, we're talking about hard costs being shared between some proportional basis between city and county without having some number here, even within the recommendation that right. the, um, Alderman Hanna is, is, is putting forward. Um, whatever proportion is settled, is it the city's 50-50, is it 60-40, to some degree of that? Um, the city taxpayer is responsible for 100% of the city's And somewhere between 40 to 30 percent of the county's portion. So once again, we're looking at that the the city taxpayer is still paying more than their fair share. Uh, in addition, the recommendation is the most inexpensive one would be at the um, um, the city police station, which is currently under construction, uh, which of course the city taxpayer is paying for. Uh, that's the reason why we don't have to pay eight million dollars or four million dollars, is because we're already building one locally that the county will now move into. Uh, so we're not really sharing the cost of the city uh, police station amongst the entire county. Uh, that's why it is the least, because we're already paying the front cost up front. In addition, the county requires the city to buy the land this police station is going on, uh, and again, at some proportional amount of the cost, which means that the city taxpayer paid, already owned the land, had to buy it for themselves to some proportion, again, because being a county taxpayer, having to buy it from the county. So I see now three ways that the, the city taxpayer may not necessarily benefit. How is the best way that I can explain to them that there is a benefit to the city taxpayer throughout? I guess using all those numbers out there, my concerns is what does the county see in terms of the, this, the city taxpayer, whom I represent? Um, how can I explain to them that this is a good deal? Mr. Maples, would, would you be able to answer this? <laughs> you could use the mic over there. Okay, that would be fine. Well, the succinct answer is I can't answer it because the, I mean, I have my own personal thoughts, but the subcommittee really did not address those issues. They just said share the cost on some basis, and that's something that would have to be negotiated between the city and the county. The, the one issue I can't answer for you because it's fact, it's not opinion, is that city taxpayers are paying 35 or 40 percent of county dispatch and 100 percent of city dispatch. Exactly. So if if the cost of dispatch, the operational costs, et cetera, on a day-to-day, -day, year to year basis is spread out among the entire county, then that immediate cost burden on the city budget would go down. So that's as far as I can go because I understand I understand your questions, sure. but I can't answer for you on behalf of the subcommittee because we didn't address them. And anything I would say would be personal, and that's really not not fair to the committee. Yes. So, I guess follow-up statement on that. Um, I would be interested in supporting this. Um, the operational costs of the funding sources being spread throughout the county taxpayer, so we're paying, you know, taxpayer for taxpayer equally. Uh, but I would also support this only if the hard costs were also negotiated with to be a county wide, and versus a, a proportional basis that each each homeowner pays their assessed value portion of that. Uh, that I would support that, but I would not support it otherwise. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Alderman Ryan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Mr. Maples and his uh, committee. It's a good report. Um, I'm, I'm looking at this, 
And the supervisory costs are the big negative of the, of the entire operation. You know, presently in the city, we have uh, shift captains, yes. basically, that oversee dispatch along with having a uh, communications manager. And if this indeed is going to be in the new police department, I think it would probably be a big so cost savings to have that, that same arrangement where you have your shift supervisor also oversee dispatch at that time. Uh, that would, uh, according to this, um, save somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, wherever my numbers are here. We're talking 500 and about a half million dollars a year. And then, then this would make sense. Um, if we do put it in the new police department, we're already spending money to construct the building anyway. We've already paid for the land. Um, if we can operate it, sharing the cost with the county for less money than we are now, uh, makes a lot of sense. So I, w I would support this, provided that uh, we come to an agreement with the county on sharing the cost of it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Alderman Clahunas. Thank you, Chairperson, or President. Um, my, I, I thought the report was very interesting. My argument, the only argument for the new uh, facility, 8,000 square feet all by itself, would be that this whole negotiation of cost would be separate. You know, the state, I mean, the city and the county would be billed separately on a proportional basis. Everything would be, you know, clear, clearly stated as a cost for dispatch. It wouldn't be something that the city had to pay for twice or uh, the county was getting you know, a better deal on it or something. That's my only argument for it. And I, I also think um, you, Mr. Maples, thinks, uh, think that there isn't much political difference between the city and the county. Sometimes people think there is a lot. And you know whether, whether one uh, department would take over the management of or another, I'm not sure. Um, I think it's something to be considered. But that would be my argument for a new facility. Be, you know, Clear, clear costs, clear cost assessment. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I had the opportunity to sit in on a quite a few of the meetings, and I just want to re reiterate something that uh, Mr. Maple said, is that the city of Sheboygan and the county of Sheboygan getting this done has a lot less obstacles than I saw in other presentations what other communities had to go through. Again, the foresight, uh, the councils, the software, the radios, so many other counties had so many things that were so uh, much more insurmountable than, than what we have. Also, I did a little research today. I believe right now the city dis the city dispatch right now is costing the city of Sheboygan taxpayers a line item in the police budget, a budget of close to a million dollars. I, I believe I'm correct on that. And uh, in talking with Mr. Gebhardt today, the city of Sheboygan has 16,836 uh, real property taxpayers. So that million dollar, I'll wait a minute. The million, dollar, the million dollar line item in the police department budget right now for city taxpayers is being paid by those 16,836 uh, people that pay property taxes in the city. The total number of taxpayers in, the, in Sheboygan County, according to the uh, county treasurer, is 52,211 taxpayers. So if indeed the city and the county can get together on this, uh, and again, the city is now paying for that million dollars in our own dispatch, plus about 40% of the county dispatch. Whatever the, whatever the numbers come for the hard costs and the salaries and wages will then be divided amongst 52,211 taxpayers. So I, I think it, uh, it makes a lot of sense uh, for us to take a real hard look at this, if for no other reason to broaden this, broaden this cost and in the future, we are going to have to buy new equipment. If the city remains on its own, we're going to have to, uh, we're going to, have to buy new councils eventually. 
and this, the, the county is going to have to do the same thing. So I think it makes a lot of sense that as we go forward, if we can come together on this, to face these costs together and divide it amongst that total county uh, taxpayer base. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? See none. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Alderman Manny. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> as I listen, these are the things I note and I simply uh, offer these as a reflection. Uh, benefits for the county would include certainly uh, increased training for emergency medical dispatch, so they would be better serviced by uh, more uh, fully trained personnel. Uh, benefits for the city perhaps cost savings, but the proof is in the pudding when an agreement is made with percentages. Until that point in time, we don't know if that's a benefit or not. Uh, benefits for both would include greater supervision and better backup with greater uh, margin for error and protection. Uh, those are the benefits that I see, and I'd be happy for others to uplift another benefit or two that I don't note. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Renflesh. Yeah. Thank you, Alderman Manny, for the benefit analysis. Um, in general, like I said, it's something I support. The biggest benefit I see is over time spreading of the cost to every taxpayer within the county versus just the city of Sheboygan, those that I represent. Uh, so I do see a, a large benefit uh, over time uh, and I will support uh, the recommendation coming out of this committee to go to Common Council. Um, however, if within the negotiations whatever does come back uh, to the Council, if I feel that, that it, the the negotiation did not lead to an equitable distribution of the, the fixed costs as well as the, the operational costs, uh, then I would probably vote against it with a heavy heart because of the overall goal that I have in mind is to, to spread the, the, that burden throughout, to lessen the burden on the individual taxpayer. Uh, so I'll keep my eyes open clearly on that to see what kind of negotiations are taking place on that, but I will support it at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Alderman Kittleson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I, I, to be really sure in my mind, I, I'd like to ask Lieutenant Reinfeld um, uh, about the efficiency of it all. I mean, um, how do the, they feel? Can, can this be a more efficient way to, to operate if we do combine the dispatch? Um, Lieutenant, would you please come up to the mic? Thank you. Okay, efficiencies over time could probably happen. You have to remember that this is going to be a long time in the implementation and it's not going to be easy. You're taking two totally different groups of people from two totally different departments and putting them together. And they have to learn. There we go. Is that better? They have to learn the policies and procedures of both departments. That's going to take time. You're going to lose some people during this process. You're going to have to rehire. You're going to have to train. There's going to be a lot of steps that have to be completed before you get to a truly operational center. And a lot of the people that we listened to that came in and gave their presentations to us said it was 10 to 12 years before they had a truly operational center that was up and running and saving money and being efficient. So yes, it, it will happen, but it's not going to happen immediately. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, just a minute. Alderman Manny, do you have a question? Thank you, for Madam Chair. Yes, I do. Would you comment on the supervisory aspect? I think your comments would be helpful for us to hear this evening. Right now, the situation is that there's one manager in each department. That would be myself in our department, and I believe it's a captain, in Captain Nash in the, in the Sheriff's Department who manages their dispatch center. When we are not here, the dispatchers are managed and supervised by the on-duty supervisors. Now what you need to know there is that these are the police supervisors who are doing this and it is like second duty to them. Their primary duty is taking care of everything that's going on out on the road with the officers. And when you combine now two departments and you have six, there will be about six dispatchers on duty at any one time, they are not going to be able to oversee what's going on on the road and still maintain successfully what's going on in-house. And now they have to do this for two departments. So you really do need full supervision. Any further questions? 
Thank you. You're welcome. Seeing none, I would ask that the motion be reread. Certainly. The motion reads, uh, first there's a, <clears throat> a motion to file with a recommendation to Mayor Perez to prepare a resolution for passage during the next Common Council meeting requesting that the county combine its dispatch facility with the city of Sheboygan's and that the new police station be the location for the combined dispatch center with the backup being located at the Sheriff's Department as presented by the City County Shared Services Subcommittee. Okay, thank you. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Chair votes aye, opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to item number four, RO number 335, 535 0607 by Director of Planning and Development, and this is from February 19th, 2007, Council Agenda number 2241, submitting your information, a memo regarding tax incremental districts to the Finance Committee, a composite of the tax incremental law, and an analysis of all tax city tax incremental districts that have been created and their status. Um, Ms. Enders, would you please come and share with us your information? I wonder if I can. Do you mind if I? Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, this report that's in front of you tonight was actually um, based on a request from Alderperson Boren, who had read an article, and I'm going to have to put my glasses on for this, entitled, Cities Should Be More Deliberate About Financing Tool. The article asked Wisconsin cities and villages to use the following four principles to promote high development in their home communities, understand the local real estate market, don't become beholden to one development. Consider the full range of costs and benefits and take steps to improve the quality of TIF requests. So what the finance director, Rich Gebhardt, and I did was we combined some information together into this report, and we gave this to the finance committee. It was then referred on to the Common Council and then on to this committee. So what I did was I attached um, some background to address some of the issues that were mentioned in the article. And I think that... The article um, did address some very good, solid questions, so I attempted to answer those along with giving you some additional background information on TIF. Um, what I'll do is I'll cover basically TIF 101 and then have the finance director get into specifics on the city, and then we can address any questions that you have. Um, okay, as, uh, as many of you know, the city of Sheboygan has a long history of TIF district creation. To date, the districts have not caused a financial burden on the taxpayers. They have revitalized blighted areas, created jobs, and increased the city's tax base. To better understand what an important financial tool TIF is to cities, and it actually is one of the few tools that we have for economic development, I summarized an in in introduction to tax incremental finance provided by the Department of Revenue. Um, the legislature found municipalities were postponing or canceling public improvements that would allow new development because their taxpayers paid the price while everyone that shared the expanded tax base profited. Establishing a tax incremental system relieved this inequity. Plus, it benefited Wisconsin's people by improving and otherwise promoting their health, safety, welfare, and prosperity. TIF is aimed at eliminating blight, rehabilitating declining property values, and promoting industry and mixed-use development. There were already laws that were in place for these purposes, but um, lack of incentives and financial resources had stymied efforts to use them effectively. TIF works because it provides its own financing resource. It is basically a financing tool that cities and villages can use to promote tax base expansion. The towns also have this ability, but it's very limited. When a TIF district is created, the aggregate equalized value of taxable and certain city-owned property is established by the Department of Revenue. This is called the tax incremental base, so you have your baseline. 
The city then installs public improvements and property values grow. Taxes paid on the increased value are used to pay for projects undertaken by the city. This is the tax increment. So many times when we talk about the base and the increment that's developed and the increment pays for the improvements, we throw out a lot of terminology, but it is very simple. There's a base, the increment grows, and you use that increment to pay off your debt. And when your debt is paid down, then you can close out the district. And of late, Rich will talk about that, we have closed out some of the districts. The underlying assumption of the TIF law is that no new development would have taken place if the city had not created the district. Um, the, uh, the article that was submitted also called for a local TIF policy. And what I did was I did research um, a couple of, of other communities, Madison being one. And Madison was actually in the process of undertaking their own research to find out what other communities had TIF policies. Um, after the finance committee meeting, I did get back a report on TIF policies throughout the state. We're, um, I would say, probably quite similar to other communities in how we undertake TIF and you know what we use as a basis for creating a TIF district. Um, and what a lot of the communities found out is that the ones that did have a policy in place, it um, actually then stymied development in a way because each project is very different. You know, and as we as Rich will go through the, the different districts that we have, you can see they're created for different purposes, whether it's mixed use, manufacturing, some sort of, you know, blight where there's a, a housing component to it. So having a TIF policy in place I think is, you know, maybe not a bad idea, but you just have to be careful about um, how it's created. Based on the TIF statutes, um, you know, and one, one thing that we have in place as, a, as our own check is the state statute. So based on the statute, projects are reviewed by the city of Sheboygan staff, submitted to the appropriate committees, which is the Joint Review Board, Plan Commission, the Finance Committee, and ultimately the Common Council. So there are diff uh, many layers of government approvals that we do have to go through. Um, something that I'll, I'll quickly go through is um, I submitted in, as part of the packet top 10 TIF questions. And I think this is a, a good summary and a, kind of a down and dirty on TIF as far as um, what, some, what the questions that come up. Um, what is TIF? I explain that. Um, do property owners in a TID pay lower or higher taxes than other residents? And I have heard that one. Um, owners of a property in a TID pay the same rate of taxes that owners outside the TID pay. Neither is a TIF is neither a tax freeze nor a tax increase, but a special allocation method for taxes collected on property value increases within the district. Who may create TID and how? Cities and villages can create TIDs. And then, as I mentioned before, towns have um, some authority, but on a very limited scale. What are some of the eligible project costs? Examples for TID include capital development, financing, real property assembly, consulting and legal services, organizational activities, relocation, contributions and payments necessitated by the project plan, utility construction, Develop directly associated with the TID or the removal of contain or containment of lead contamination. And at this point, I'll, I'll talk to slightly about what this is, is a, a, more of a, a straight TIF. We also have two environmental TIFs that are fairly new. One was Northgate, the other is Optenberg. And the Optenberg was the, um, the pay-as-you-go TIF. So as environmental costs are incurred that have been proved approved by the Department of Revenue, then the developers reimburse for those eligible costs and they're environmental only. What is the maximum life of a TIF? For TIDs created um, under 66.1105, existing TIDs created before October 1st of 95 have a, a life of 27 years, but you can obviously close those out before that. Blight or rehab TIDs created after September 30th of, 90, of 95 have a 27-year li year life. Industrial TIDs created after 10-1 of 95 and before 10-1 of 04 have a 23-year life. Industrial or mixed-use TIDs created after 10-1 of 04 have 20 years. And then with joint review board approval, 
the life of the TID may be extended for three to four, three or four years. Are there limits on the use of TIF? The equalized value of property in the district plus the value increment of all existing districts cannot exceed 12% of the total, total equalized value of taxable property within the municipality. I think Rich is going to touch on where we are with that. And then we have, there were some other um, kind of issues that, other questions, but they relate more directly to the filing of paperwork. Um, who certifies the value in increment annually? It's the Department of Revenue. What accounting reports are required to maintain a TID? Each year, municipalities within a TID are required to distribute an annual report to all overlying taxing jurisdictions, summarizing the status of the TIDs they administer. What that means is when we talk about a TID, the, the taxing entities, all of those taxes stay within that district in order to pay down the, the debt. So whether it's Lakeshore Technical College, the county, the school district, the city, they all stay within that district until the debt is paid down and then you close it out. And then the benefit to all of those entities is that they then have that improved tax base to work off of. Um, how are incremental taxes generated? And it's just as I mentioned, property taxes, property tax rates for the school, county, technical college, and municipality are based on the taxable value of the TID at the time it is created. These rates are then applied to the TID value increment, which results in additional revenues collected for the district's fund. And development costs are paid from these revenues before the added tax base is shared. And then I, um, in your packets, you also see that I, I did put in a comparison of the regular TIDs versus the environmental TIDs. And they're quite similar, but one is um, the straight TID is directly through the Department of Revenue, and the environmental TIDs, you also work with the Department of Natural Resources. So if I could turn it over to Rich now. Thank you. Um, what I try to do is do a one-page summary of my multi-page report that was included in your packet. Uh, it was entitled Analysis of Tax Incremental Financing Districts. It was dated December 31st of 06. Um, what... Um, like to do, I guess, is, is go through some of the main points. Um, the first tax incremental district was formed in 1984 in the downtown area. Currently, the city has 11 tax incremental districts, including two environmental TIF districts. The city has the capacity to form new TIF districts with base values up to 114 million. And if you do have that report handy, that I refer to of the analysis, on the second page, there is a, a listing of our current TIF districts by number. It looks something like this. Okay. And uh, it has a description. As you can see on there, some of them are um, industrial oriented and with manufacturing, with either business park or certain industries. And uh, others are ones you're familiar with, like the South Pier, um, Washington Square areas, the commercial, Northgate. Uh, so you can see there's kind of a blend of, of purposes for those and also has uh, the incremental values alongside of that and then the tax increments that are generated in the third column. The private development has 
created incremental increases in property values of 244 million. The city has closed out three districts with incremental values of 40 million. Therefore, the incremental value of the current districts is 204 million, which is 7.7% of the city's equalized values. The total 2007 debt service requirements for all the districts is 4.2 million. The 204 million of incremental value generates 5.2 million of incremental taxes. Two districts currently have debt service requirements greater than their tax increments. They are District 10 to Long Water Street with a shortfall of 93,000 and Environmental District Number 1, which is a Northgate shopping center with a shortfall of 16,000. Their shortfalls are being addressed with transfers from other funds. The debt that has been issued in all the districts since 1984 totals 50 million. Currently, the outstanding debt for the TIF districts is 33 million, which is 57% of the city's total general obligation debt of 58 million. The city is paying approximately $4 million of the TIF debt per year. In September, the city will call an additional $3 million of the TIF debt for districts 6, 10, and 11. Also, I'd like to add that there also are advances between funds. Uh, there are about $4 million of advances within the, the TIF districts that are owed either to other TIF districts or to the general fund or to uh, the non borrowed capital project fund. The city has dissolved three tax incremental districts. The first was District 2 in 1994, that was for the Rock Line expansion, which had an incremental value of 1.6 million. In 2005, District 1 was dissolved with an incremental value of 36.5 million. District 1 constructed improvements to 8th Street and the parking lots along 7th Street. District 9, which was for Watry Industry on the south side, was dissolved in 2006 with a value of one and a half million. It is anticipated that District 8, which includes the Taylor and Washington Avenue area, will be dissolved in 2008. District 8's value on 1106 was 21 million. It will be higher as the full value of the new Walmart is included. Therefore, $40 million of incremental value, or 16% of the, of the total incremental values, has been closed from the districts. With the $21 million from District 8 anticipated to close next year, the percentage of the incremental values that has been closed and placed on the property values will increase to approximately 25%. So perhaps we can open it to questions of senders or myself. Then. Are there any questions? Alderman Clayhunas. Thank you, Chair, Madam Chair. Uh, just to comment more, um, the TIF. Uh, financing um, the city takes it on but the county and the you know the county re again reaps the benefits of it they don't take on any of the debt we take on all the responsibility of the debt but that brings in revenue to the county brings in you know people moving in uh, jobs whatever it is that can affect the county um, and it also the TIF money does that go to school district too any, well, the increased value of everything goes to school districts and county tax base, right? On the new value, the um, the taxes on the new value stay within the district until the debt is paid off. Until, so it's the county, the schools, the LTC, and ours. And right. yes, when it's dissolved, it does help. Right. Uh, like when we dissolve, you know, District One downtown with the 36 million. Right. Uh, that helped to lower the tax rates within the city for all those jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. So the county rate within the city would be lower because of the higher base, or really, yes, I guess it's you know county wide because it's a part of their base. Right. So it's it's to the benefit the city's taking on this risk that eventually benefits the school district and the county. You know, once once the debt is paid, it it seems as you know as if again the city is sticking its neck out for the sake of a bigger picture. Um, and the return is 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 not as is recognizable. I mean, we do get increased taxes too, but it still is you know something. I don't. Does the county take on any anything like this? Do they do any kind of financing like this? Not this directly. No, not thing? for e this direct economic development. Right now, it is within uh, municipalities, within cities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oldman Renflesh. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess clarification uh, for those who work with the numbers uh, all day and every day. Uh, <laughs> 
kind of dumb it down for the rest of us, if you would. In general, though, that when the TIF is established, the taxes that are collected for school, for county, for city, for LTC, uh, we, we use the term stay within the district, but it actually is used to pay down the debt, correct? So the, the properties within the, the district are still paying the normal tax rate, the normal taxes. It's just that, that the school district and the county and the city don't actually get those taxes at this point in time. That is instead used for the debt. Is that correct? That's correct. It is allocated for the, those debt okay. purposes. But you are also correct that they all pay the same tax rate, whether okay. it's a new development or any one that's part of the base of the district. Okay. So, so in fact, then, <clears throat> well, we have a TIF district. Um, the district itself benefits from being able to collect those taxes that would go elsewhere, pay down the debt over time, then have increased value in property taxes. Uh, but the county and the school district and LTC, and actually the city too, doesn't actually get those taxes until it's paid off. Is that correct? That is correct. And in some cases, I guess, um, you know, we see that within our operational cost as we may be expanding some of our, our costs, such as South Pier uh, maintenance, okay. but there's no increase in tax base to offset those operational okay. costs. So it, in, I guess, summary, it, it benefits the city to be able to have a district um, where development is not occurring naturally, if you will, and you know, having a way of jumpstarting that without putting at risk. We're not bonding for the whole city. We're using those taxes that are already collected for a specific reason uh, within that. Uh, in the meantime, we ask that the school district, the county, LTC go without those taxes. And then in exchange, when the district is, is closed, they'll have a higher rate that they can tax off of then. Um, over time, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Ryan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I think uh, the easy way to explain it is without the TIF districts and without the city funding to, to develop these properties, they would not you know, would not exist, basically a lot of them. Um, without, you know, without, without leveraging the city in order to make these happen, there would not be the long-term benefit once the TIF is paid off of that tax base. So, I mean, it's, you know, as long as these TIFs cash flow themselves, um, this is a lot of uh, uh, money that in the long run more than repays the cost of the TIF. So I think, uh, you know, it's, it's basically, I think, a positive thing rather than a negative cost. Okay. Yes, Paula. Thank you. If I can make one comment also. Um, Rich had mentioned there were a couple districts that were um, that aren't cash flowing at the moment. You find ways that you can, okay, so without it being a taxpayer burden, where you used um, other funds to pay down the debt. One of them is the Water Street neighborhood, and you know we have a piece of property that we've been working to develop, and it's been a little bit slow. But what we've done is we modified that district. Or actually, another district, so that we could take that positive increment to assist that district until it gets back up on its feet. And you can do that through the state statutes. But um, you know what you want to do is ultimately you want to get these districts paid down as soon as you can. Thank you, Alderman Renflesh. Thank you. Uh, follow up to the, well, the benefits obviously is there that we get the development that naturally would not had not been occurred. The downside is, is then, while we have, um, I believe Alden Bourne had let's give a number of 16,000 taxpayers in the city approximately there, a portion of that then is removed and the burden increases actually then on the remainder. Is that, would that be a fair statement, Ben? Well, I think it's also stated that without these districts, a lot of that new increment probably would not have existed, such as a new industrial park in those exactly. type of areas. So uh, basically that is held until uh, the infrastructure is, is paid for, and then it is uh, added on to the general tax base right. and is a benefit at that point to all the, all the taxpayers. And just to follow up on that then, <clears throat> so in exchange then for perhaps a bit higher right now, uh, for those of us not within the district, or I guess, I guess everybody really would be because you have to balance that out amongst mm -hmm. everybody, but without it, 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 the final number is $244 million of incremented, incremental Increases property values. Is that what the TIF districts have done for Sheboygan? Yes, as of uh, January first of um, '06, that was the total incremental value from the new development. And that would not have happened without TIF districts. That's correct. <laughs> yes. 
Thank you. Alderman Heidemann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Sheboygan is not the only community that uses TIFs. Okay. So is there a set limit throughout the entire county that would have to be, is there a certain balance that um, we would take up all the TIF money and none of the other communities would be able to use TIF money, or is it just per community? The uh, regulations are from uh, the state statute, and what the restriction is that we, the total amount of incremental values, which we're referring to the 244 million, that total amount cannot uh, exceed 12% if we wish to form a new TIF district, and right now we're at 7.7%. Within our own community. Within our own community right here, community. yes. But it really does not relate out to the other communities. It really is our uh, circumstances in reference to the state statute. Okay, so then when the county looks at the amount of TIF money or the TIF districts we have, it, they don't formulate that into their... Uh, tax percentage saying we're not getting money from these areas of Sheboygan, we're going to raise our taxes so we get additional money from outside those TIF districts. All the entities, including the city, uh, look at setting our tax rate without the TIF value. You first make that calculation, then after that, after you set your, your tax rates for all the entities, uh, then based on that same rate that you're going to collect from the new development, you calculate what tax increments you're going to get from the new development. So basically you're setting the rate as if that value didn't exist. Thank you. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the, in the article that I, that I submitted, there, something piqued my interest in here. Uh, understand the local real estate market, and I, and I understand it's probably difficult to have a crystal ball, but one of the things it states in the article here is that TIF is an efficient development incentive only when it is used to spur development that the market would not otherwise provide. And it goes on to say that cities should consider what is likely, uh, what is likely to happen to the site over the full life of the proposed TIF district if no assurance is provided, uh, if no assistance is provided, I'm sorry. Uh, and again, I realize it's hard to have a crystal ball, but is that kind of a policy that you try to use a crystal ball to look into the, the full life of what the TIF is to assure that, you know, that this can't be privately developed? I mean, I can tell you from a staff perspective that um, when the developer comes into my office and talks about TIF, I look at this very carefully and make sure that um, there, you know, that it's it's absolutely needed because you know it does it, for all the reasons that we listed. It's it's one of our few economic development tools, but there's also a lot of ramifications to it, and um, there's a lot of serious negotiations going on, and we do take these very seriously and make sure just, you know, what was stated in that article, that it is absolutely needed, and that kind of the, the but for, if it wasn't for this, would the development occur? Okay, thank you. If, if I could just follow up, <clears throat> this seems to be a very timely topic right now. In yesterday's uh, Sunday Milwaukee Journal, there was an article in the business section that says, let's put an end to TIFF, T-I-F in caps, TIFFS, T-I-F-F-S. And so it's a, it's a very hot topic around the state right now with TIFF districts. And one, uh, one thing I just wanted to follow up with, with Paulette, you said you had, you had uh, looked at Madison and a couple of other ones. Uh, do you think it's, as we go forward, that it's going to be good to have a specific TIFF policy for the city of Sheboygan? Right. To maybe, uh, I guess, improve, maybe try to improve locally on some of this, you know, what the state is telling us to do? Um, I hate to say it this way, but yes and no. Um, I think if we, if we do have a policy, we need to look at it very carefully so that we don't end up stymieing development and say it's, you know, ABC and nothing else. Mm -hmm. um, you need to take a look at... Um, you know, maybe all of the information that I compiled from the other communities, because that's a little bit of the feedback that I received was the ones that do have policies are really considering, do they want a policy or, or should they just be, you know, following state statute and the running through the proper committees and ultimately letting their common council decide. Thank you. Thank you. President Hanna. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I appreciate the, the quantifying the 
uh, net new value to taxpayers as as TIFs mature, is there any way you can estimate the number of jobs that have been created through the efforts of these TIFs over the last decade? I would I would hazard a guess it's been a success story in terms of job creation. And I just, you know, from my experience in the city for the past a little over five years, I know that, you know, just in certain districts alone, let's say, for example, TIF District Number 6, which would include South Pier, you know, it's been literally hundreds of jobs. But that's a number that I could pull together, but it would take a little bit of time, but I could do it. I'm more interested in that I, the TIFs are not a perfect tool. And there's some shortcomings in the distribution of the benefits are not necessarily as fair as we'd want. But I don't want us to lose sight that in addition to the fact that we've improved a blighted area or promoted a project that wouldn't necessarily have been promoted without our help, we've also created jobs. And, and those folks, a percentage of them have become homeowners and taxpayers, students in our school districts attending LTC. So there's lots of positives that come out of this I, I know you know we can we can be critical that it's not as fair as it could be but it is what it is and and I do believe there's been a, a real net positive to our city over the last 10 years okay thank you yes Vice President Warren. thank you madam chair just to follow up on something that uh, Alderman Hanna was saying is there anything in the state statutes that says what kind of jobs are to be created? Are these families supporting jobs that the state wants us to have, or are, 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 have we seen mostly service jobs? Nothing that, not that there's anything wrong with service jobs, but are there any guidelines from the state as to what kind of jobs we should be uh, encouraging with these TIF districts? And I was just, I guess, a two part answer to that. As far as Alder Person Hannah, um, you know, probably two of the biggest job generators in the city have been our two industrial parks, you know, the older and then the new business center. Good, solid manufacturing jobs, local businesses that were able to expand in our community. If not for those parks, they may have left. Um, but as far as TIF, language, TIF statute, the law, um, they don't... It's one of the goals, but they don't specifically address what type of jobs. Typically, the state will do that through their grant and loan programs, where they'll say we want, you know, a, they'll be looking at that hourly rate and the type of job. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Alderman Klahunas. That's okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Alderman Wangaman. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, just to add another ingredient to the mix, Recently, I was doing some research on the internet on uh, TIF districts, and I happened to come across a report from the University of Illinois Economics Department, which is uh, renowned nationwide for their expertise in economic manners. And they were required <coughs> or requested by numerous cities, large and small, throughout Illinois, from the smallest all the way up to the largest being Chicago, to study TIF districts, and they did a three-year study. And uh, it's a very interesting report, and I wish now I had provided copies to the council, but I'll be glad to uh, supply copies to the Finance uh, Committee because I'd like them to take a look at this. Their conclusion was that in many, many cases, while TIF districts expanded commerce and uh, productivity or whatever value within the TIF district, outside the TIF district, they tended to have the opposite effect and that when they balanced one against the other, that they actually came up with a negative component. And they weren't saying cities should not go into TIF districts, but they said they should do them with a great deal of caution because sometimes the uh, cure can be worse than the disease. And they found actually that in areas, in some cities, that the cities actually went downhill after they uh, uh, used TIF districts. and they. Part of that study was they compared cities that had no TIF districts against cities that had TIF districts over like a 10-year period, and they found at the end of that period, almost in every case, the cities that did not have the TIF districts did better. So it's a very interesting report, and I make no recommendations one way or another as to the validity of this report, but I, I would assume that it's a very valid report. 
and I'll be glad in the very near future to provide that to the uh, Finance Committee. And I, I wish, I apologize for not having it, bringing it along tonight, because I think it would have been very germane to what we're uh, talking about here tonight. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Alderman Ryan. Uh, I appreciate uh, Alderman Wengerman's uh, uh, view about the article, but it, it seems to me that if a city had no TIF districts, and still did well, it could possibly be because they did not need TIF districts and they were in a, a geographical setting that was to their benefit or something of the sort. Um, whereas if you, had, if, you, if you as a city say, okay, well, they did well without TIF districts, we just won't do it, uh, there's a good possibility you might just miss the boat. So, you know, there's, you know to put it very simply, um, Sheboygan's come a long way since our TIF districts. We wouldn't have the marina, we wouldn't have the South Pier. Uh, this entire A Street uh, was a ghost town a few years back. And uh, I think it's been good for the city. I think it's something we do need to be careful with, but it's definitely uh, not anything that I think we want to uh, look at as a negative. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Clayhunas. Thank you. Now the discussion's warming up here. Um, I, just a comment, um, we also have some areas of town which are becoming blighted. Um, the, the, the mall area, the Taylor Heights area, which kind of reflects something, you know, if we shift things one place, is there enough business to pick up where those people left and, you know, moved on? Or is it just going, you know, is there no one else? Does everybody just want the new, the big, and the beautiful? And the old and tired and maybe traditional fades away into, you know, cracked blacktop and weeds all over the place. I don't know. I think it's an interesting comment. I think it really does give some people in Sheboygan concern that, uh, you know, we're expanding one, some places and other places are dying as well. So. And I, if I could comment on yeah. that, it's, it's all about striking a balance. And right. we will be looking at, we're, we're looking at um, consultants right now to mas assist us in master planning that area. And some of the recommendations that we're going to request for them is sources of funding. And, you know, is it grants? Is it loans? Is it TIF? Is it, you know, what sources of funding are out there in order to assist and spur that development? But it is, it's all about striking a balance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, well, thank you. Very informative. Okay, moving on to number five. It was just a presentation. RO number 2060708 by City Clerk, July 2nd, 2007, Council Agenda Number 733, submitting a communication from the Sheboygan County Taxpayers Alliance, submitting their annual proposal for action. Alderman Montemayor. Uh, thank you, Chairman Meyer. I, I thank the Sheboygan County Taxpayer Alliance for their information, and I think it's been available to us in a few committees, and we have read it, So, and I thank them again, so I make a motion to file. We have a motion to file. Is there a second? second. There's a second. Under discussion. Yes, Vice President Bourne. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Uh, one of the items that the Sheboygan County Taxpayers Alliance had in their, uh, their uh, uh, proposal for action was for the council to consider a residency requirement. And I brought forward a resolution uh, in, in looking over this plan of action. I did bring forward a resolution at the last council meeting for a residency requirement for all new hires uh, all people that are all new hires for the city of Sheboygan, both rep representative and non representative employees, and that's been uh, referred to the uh, salary and grievances committee. Uh, I agreed with I agreed with the Sheboygan County Taxpayers Alliance on that issue. That I think it's time for the city to take a hard look at requiring new employees uh, to live in the city uh, and share and share in the tax burden. Uh, 
of the rest of us, the rest of the city taxpayers. And in light of last week's announcement or a week ago that we've lost 2,000 people in population in the city of Sheboygan, uh, there certainly is going to be plenty of room for those people to find real estate in Sheboygan if they don't already live in Sheboygan. So I'll leave it to the Salary and Grievances Committee to work out the details, but I thought that was a good point of the Taxpayers Alliance, and that's why I brought forward the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Renflesh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Alderman Warren, for stealing my thunder. <laughs> uh, that's the one that really <laughs> popped out when I looked at this as well. Um, obviously, we're at, in most of the issues that we are already currently taking a look within various committees, I look forward to seeing next year's summary as well, and, and hopefully there's progress made in that uh, there as well. But the um, big one that I'm, I'm a big supporter of would be the uh, Executive Summary Number 10, Residence Requirement of All City Employees. Um, understand that it's not going to be as easy uh, as saying it's done now because we do have union contracts that uh, we have to, uh, to look at and of course there's negotiation that has to be done in certain ways uh, for that as well uh, but uh, I would certainly support that uh, as well and look forward to that passing uh, shortly. Um, my first term on council we did make an exception for the um, Board of Water Commissioners I understand president of the board, that board, um, and keep in mind that that it needs to be addressed as well. The exception's already been made by council, we need to go back in. If we're looking at, at all employees, I, I definitely make a strong uh, push to, for that one as well. Thank you. Alderman Wangaman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It's an item that I hear about a lot, too. People, you know, they really question why, if a city worker makes his living here, why he shouldn't be paying his taxes here why he moves outside the county and then comes in and uses the city uh, amenities such as parks, and, you know, the library and that sort of thing. And they, uh, it's a, really a part uh, of the situation that people are very much upset about. And I think it's something that uh, was a long time in coming and I compliment Alderman Bourne for bringing this forward because it's something we need to act on. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments, questions? Seeing none, we have a motion on the floor to file the communication from the Sheboygan County Taxpayers Alliance. All in favor, say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Alderman Renflesh. Uh, before we adjourn, um, my concern on number four, the RO uh, from Director of Planning Development, um, my understanding is that we do need to take some action on that or the RO sits out there indefinitely. Uh, so I make a motion to file. Second. Motion and a second to file, item number four. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And thank you very much for pointing that out. Second. Motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Thank you for coming. <laughs>